Welcome a los coloquios de física de la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Jenny Colon. Uh, she is the Brian J. Thompson Professor in Optical Engineering at the University of Rochester, the co-founder and CTO of Light Top Tech, a startup on 3D high definition microscopy and the director of the Center for Freeform Optics, supported by the National Science Foundation in the US and corporations worldwide. The Center for Freeform Optics is a collaborative consortium for industry university cooperative research that is vertically integrated from, from mathematics to precision optical manufacturing of freeform optics in order to transform the optics of the 21st century. She earned an optical engineering diploma from the Institut Optique Théorie et Appliqué, France, and a Master of Science and PhD in Optical Science from the College of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona. Professor Roland is a fellow of the Optical Society of America and the Society of Photo-Optical Instrumentation Engineers. She is the recipient of the 2014 Osa David Richardson Medal, the 2017 Edmund Hajim Outstanding Faculty Award, the University of Arizona College of Optical Sciences 2019 Alumna of the Year Award, a 2018 Engineer of Distinction by the Rochester Engineering Society, and the recipient of the 2020 Joseph Freinhofer Award and Burley Prize. She was nominated and is currently running for the OSA Vice President. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> Professor Wollen. Um, let's start with the collective. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Claudia. Uh, buenas tardes, uh, el todos. Um, I'm going to speak in English. I know a little bit of Spanish, but uh, uh, definitely more comfortable in English here. Um, so today I want to talk to you about the rise in freeform optics and summarize some success stories and challenges. And I tell you the talk knowing there's a lot of it's a fairly new field for most people, and I will deliver the talk with that perspective. Um, so first, I want to, to also let you know that if this presentation speaks to you and you want to learn more about freeform optics, I will be teaching uh, a course on freeform optics at the University of Rochester this time. Uh, the course number is OPT440. And actually, I'll be co-teaching this course with Dr. Aaron Bauer, who is actually on the call right now to listening to the talk as well. And uh, because it will be online, anyone can register actually for the class. That's a great idea about that. And you could register as credit or audit if you just want to learn about optics, uh, the free form without really taking a real class. In both cases, the students will have to register to get access to the class materials because it's all online. Uh, there's a prerequisite to the class is that especially for credit, that you need to have one prior course in optical system design. So if you don't have that prior knowledge, you may want to try to gain that knowledge first and then maybe a year from now to take the course. It will be offered uh, pretty much on a regular basis. Uh, so just to let you know in case you're interested because it's a very unique kind of material and it's not taught very many places. So I'm very excited to put that online so we can actually really reach out to more people and build a bigger community together. So we'll start with what is freeform optics. Freeform optics includes freeform surfaces as part of the optical design. And I would say that the freeform surface at the very first level uh, is a, a surface whose shape lacks transitional or rotational symmetry. So think of it the first, at the first level, that if something is not rotational symmetric, it's most likely be freeform, but not always. And there's a lot of, uh, of things about that. So the second slide here, I'm gonna say, here's kind of a, a little bit of a discussion where we have some two surfaces on the left and two surfaces on the right. On the left, if we are doing a little quiz right now together and get you to participate here in the class, <laughs> if it was a class, 
you would have you would all agree that a sphere is not a freeform. So if the surface is spherical, it's not a freeform. But below that, we have something that's called a conic sphere, so that the pass from a sphere, but it's still rotationally symmetric. So most people would say it's not a freeform, but you will find sometimes, you know, in the industry especially, someone may want to call those uh, even a sphere freeform just because they need sometimes similar tools to make those surfaces. But I would say that 99% of the people would agree that a sphere or a conic sphere are not freeform. Now, on the right, we have a gray zone. So at the top, you have a toroid. So it's just basically, it's almost like a sphere, but you have two different radius of curvature and two different orientation perpendicular to each other. And, uh, and then below that, you have an off-axis conic sphere. So it's like the one on the right, on the left, but now you're going to take a section of it. You see a cylinder. I took a cylinder, blue cylinder, and I, I would cut out what's in the cylinder. Think of the cylinder as being a cutting tool. And I would be cutting a little piece of that rotation symmetric and just keep that. But in fact, that part is still part of this rotation symmetric surface. So it's an off-axis conic or a sphere. And basically, it's a gray zone because in design, the toroid is not very powerful in design. It's very, you know, it's not sufficient to do anything really significant uh, for in terms of a freeform imaging design. Uh, the off-axis conic is a lot more powerful, but still limited. And we have shown that freeform can gain advantage compared to an off-axis conic, for example. And there's also a lot of other implications that goes with that in terms of optical testing, testing when you do metrology and you try to measure your part, you know, it's very different to measure um, even a toroid or an off-axis conic where there are, you know, tests that are available to measure those versus a full free form where there you need new metrology. So that's kind of the gray zone on the right. And so here it can also summarize here. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is what I call the pyramid of the fringe Zernike polynomials. So Zernike polynomials come in kind of, they're all the same, they're, but they're different sets. So if you start working with Zernike polynomials, you really need to pay attention to what set you're using. And here, in a lot of our work, we use fringe, but also we could use some other sets sometime when we want, because the fringe are limited to about 37 terms, something like that. And so we would like, so sometimes we use other Zernike if we want to go further than that. Uh, different Zonica sets, but they're all related in very specific ways. It's just a question of learning the rules of the game. But what I'm representing here is a pyramid of Zonica. And what you see in the central line, you see basically all, the central line is all rotationally symmetric surfaces, like the S-sphere we talk about. You know, so you start with, you know, with a sphere and then an S-sphere going on down. And Basically, that's what people have been doing for 100 years. I mean, there were many using those in large part for designing optical systems. And then the toroid we just talked about is right above that red line, dash line that I made here. You have a toroid here. Uh, and then you have two components of it because when you have something that's not rotationally symmetric, like a toroid is not because you have two different radius of curvature in two different directions, they are different of each other therefore it's not rotationally symmetric, then you need two components to be able to clock that toroid in your system. So a toroid is actually right above what I would call the freeform line in design because it's really a base surface, but it's, it, it's non rotationally symmetric, so that's why it's a gray zone, but in design it's not so enabling, so it's, it, you could always think of it as a very lower order of maybe, you know, quote, quote, freeform. And then what we think of reform is when you kind of go below that red line and you start introducing surfaces like coma. So just in the middle here, if you see my pointer, I have coma shape. And those, that's kind of the shape to think of those figures here. Like think of it as a topography you're looking at where let's say, you know, reds are highs, blues are lows. And then you're looking at the topography of that surface. And so if the surface is shaped this way, uh, with coma with two terms, you could also clock that coma anywhere you want by having two terms. And when you start having that kind of shape, you start really enabling freeform optical design. So when you have that and some of the higher order term, typically that's when you're really starting to really enter the space of design for freeform. But in fabrication, really, any surface that's not rotogy symmetric 
about the apex is typically considered free form. So the toroid is considered free form in fabrication and now axis conic for sure is considered free form and, 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 and so on. So it's, it could be a little confusing, but that's kind of a, just to kind of distinguish between those things. So free form optics, really why all this noise about free form optics is poised to really radically change the optics industry by replacing centuries of optical design base on components with radial symmetry. So basically going back is like going from that one line, that vertical line that is all symmetric. Now we're expanding in the pyramid. We're going on the side and we're going to include those shapes in our design. And, and that is definitely like a very radical move, especially in imaging. So, and you may wonder like, what am I going to cover here? Am I talking about imaging, non-imaging? So freeform, you know, has been around and we'll see a little bit of history on that. But in this talk, I'm going to really focus on imaging because this is really where we've been spending a lot of our effort, uh, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, I would say. We've done some non-imaging as well, but there are many more experts in the field that will give those kind of review for you on non-imaging. And the, the, the specification and the requirements are so different. So those are a little bit of different spaces. But if you want to learn a little bit more about kind of free form at the high level, you know, you can start reading those references that you have access to that through the recording of uh, the video that is being recorded. Uh, historically, there was a gathering of academia uh, and government and industry uh, that was held at the OSA headquarters uh, as an incubator meeting. So the, the OSA held is, is, is uh, giving the opportunity to uh, launch new fields. And Freeform was actually the first incubator meeting that we ran. And we had 85 participants or something like that from academia, industry, government, that was really great. And it was back in 2011 that we gathered together. And, um, and here we have some articles that were written that we, when we did the incubator, we talked both about imaging and non-imaging as well. And we tried to frame kind of the areas. And so there's a couple of publications here that you would be able to, um, to read about uh, this kind of meetings, what happened there. It's uh, published in OPN. So, um, and then two years later, a center was born, the Center for Preform Optics, we also call it CIFO, it was born in 2013, it was launched, it was founded by the National Science Foundation and many people from industry. And what we do in that center is what we call pre-competitive research. That's why we could actually work as a community, even including many people from industry, because of the nature of the research as pre-competitive, so everybody can benefit uh, for that level that's more fundamental and, 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 and not going into the competitive, competitive corner of each industry. It's one of our latest pictures of the center. We have this website, it's called centerfreeformoptics.org, and you could also visit that for our publication and for information about the center. And here is a plate of all the industry partners that have been shaping the intellectual power of the center. Uh, all the members from 2013 to now. And uh, we've had many members uh, of the center. You may recognize some names here. You could also recognize that the industry is pretty broad. It goes from, you know, consumer market to, you know, space optics. Uh, very different realm, small companies, large companies, and everybody's kind of working together to advance the knowledge about freeform optic and be able to start maturing the technology so we could start entering the market in the future. And that's why, and the center is international. We do have a few companies uh, from uh, Germany and from France, uh, Nikon from Japan, and other companies are more from the US. So on my own journey, you know, for uh, to a optic, I started in from optic back in 2000. Uh, we had the first publication, 2008 actually, casting the uh, from optic for imaging, and um, uh, and basically for me, I was working on head-worn displays. So you know, this has been kind of a hype field. It's been hyped, you know, in the past, uh, in the 90s, and then it's been hyped again more recently. You know, every time, you know, progress is being made. 
Uh, it's a very challenging area to enter the consumer market. Uh, very challenging because it's not just technology, it's also form factor and comfort and looking cool, you know. And so here's a vision of what we were working on to design an eyeglass display, you know, where uh, you would basically take the light from, could be different, you know, you could have a macro display, but you could also use small lasers, you know, like Vaxol or any other technologies. And then you're trying to get the light from here, let's say, all the way to the eyes. And you want to do that with a minimal number of optics that looks more like an eyeglass form factor. That's a pretty challenging thing to do. Um, and I have a couple of publications here also for your reading if you're interested. Uh, in Laser Focus, we wrote something soon 18. And then Bernard Kress has been doing, uh, uh, right at ODF 18, which is not so long ago, did some interesting presentation on optical challenges with mixed reality headsets. And also Dr. Uh, uh, Mignano and Benitez have been writing about optics for virtual reality. All of these papers are really uh, uh, very interesting, kind of get up to speed on what's happening in the field and so on. So that was my own journey. But in fact, you know, free form optics is really broad. So as we started the center, we started expanding in all these different areas. And here on this chart, we're actually representing also some non-imaging field and imaging as well. Uh, but you see here the mobile display we just talked about, that you know, we have application in remote sensing, infrared and military, you know, energy research, transportation, medical and biosensing, even optical transformation, where you're taking a beam and you're trying to create a different kind of beam to maybe encrypt information or something like that. And you're familiar, I'm sure, with lighting and illumination. So freeform optic is pretty broad, um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of applications. Uh, so the space is huge, and so you could imagine that's why we have so many industries joining and working with us to, to try to advance the status quo. So if you're new to freeform optics, just to put things a little bit in perspective, you know, freeform optic is really not new in fact, but it was not definitely not uh, very uh, spread at all. If you, if you go back to the 1950s and you think of a progressive lenses, they are actually freeform, but they are freeform with X-ray polynomials. So you can see here on my chart where I have on the top, I have sphere, a sphere, X-ray polynomial, of axis conic, freeform. And then on the left column, I have kind of the different industries you may have. So surface shape, optical design, fabrication, test, assembly. And in fact, if only one of those industries are weak, the whole thing cannot go. You know, the, the entire thing has to be extremely strong to be able to permeate the market, okay? So you, you are familiar with spheres, of course, you know, what's happening there. Is spheres, you know, uh, has been around for quite a, a long time, but even in 2010, which is not so long ago, 10 years ago, there was a resurgence of a sphere and looking for ways to be able to get a higher yield on a sphere by having better test methods and, and better mathematical descriptions and things like that. So, even his fears, you know, is, has been maturing all the way to 10 years ago. And now it's fairly well established now. The XY polynomial at a very low level, if you just take XY polynomial, but you only use like a few terms, like the third order, cubic, something like that. You know, then you have things like the progressive lenses in the 1950s that use XY polynomials, Alvarez lenses. They actually, those Alvarez lenses are cubic. And basically, when you slide those two surfaces to each other, they create focus. And so they were used in the Humphrey instruments for refocusing. You know, it's, so it actually made it in uh, vision instruments back then in 1970s. And then you have this amazing piece of engineering, the Polaroid SX70 single lens reflex camera that emerged in the 80s. And you see a little picture of that. It was a camera you could actually fold. And so it was a little bit off axis. That's why there was kind of a need for doing some freeform actually in the eyepiece. And that camera was designed by James Baker. If you're not familiar, he's one of the major designers of the 20th century for optical design. And he was built by Bill Plummer, which, you know, top engineer. And you could imagine in those times how challenging that could have been to try to not only create this freeform eyepiece that was a little bit an eyepiece that had some freeform in it, but also to get it to the consumer market. That was pretty amazing. Now, one of the reasons they could get away with 
not having perfect lenses then was because an eyepiece is fairly giving, you know, it's just where you look with the eye, the eye is fairly giving. As long as you could see what you're taking for a picture, you know, you're going to be pretty happy, you know. And so there was a lot of trade-off there going on. Uh, but another area that uh, maybe is more hidden in physics uh, is what you may know as computational imaging or airy beam. Those are two different, we two different fields for a while, but they are actually, you know, connected. Uh, they just have slightly different applications. Uh, but in fact, the kind of surfaces they put in the beam in computational imaging or airy beam is actually free from, they're free from, they're actually chromatic surfaces. And they are coma of third and higher order. And by doing so, for example, for an airy beam, you're able to create an extended depth of focus. So what I'm showing here at the bottom, you see the little blue square with a, it's actually the point spread function taking like transversely. So you're taking a snapshot of it as the light will go from left to right. And you can see that the light doesn't spread. So typically, you know, the light spread, it blurs, but here it doesn't spread. You know, it's kind of confined. So people would say it does create extended depths of focus. And those optics were done especially to create extended depths of focus. Sometimes they create some funny artifacts also on the image because the spread function shape and so on. But um, that can be, if you know, it turns out that if you target it at very specific application, you can actually do image processing to try to recover, to recover those uh, to the best possible, the information to an extent that maybe it's enough to make a decision, for example, you know, is this you know, an airplane or is this uh, a bird or, you know, is this, uh, what kind of airplane is that? Can we distinguish, you know, those kind of things. Uh, so that's very interesting. So there's a little bit of history there, even in imaging that freeform was already kind of birthing but I would say that today, freeform optic is rising. You know, it's like right now, it's like a really since, you know, about 10 years ago now, you know, we've been really exploding it into imaging systems on a large scale in research at least. And it's already starting to permeate some systems out there. Um, now in the column that I have on my table for off-axis connects, you can see that I separated those out from freeform, you know. Now, X5 polynomial clearly could be a freeform too, but uh, by itself, if you just use X5 polynomial, it's not an ideal uh, set to use. But some, if you know what you're doing with any kind of set, I would say, if you understand the mathematics and you have a good way to control what you're doing mathematically, you know, people can do a lot of things with pretty much any set. But we still separate them out because historically, the freeform was there, but at very low order for X5 polynomial. And then you have the off-axis conics. So those are non-rotationally symmetric. And those were expanding in the 1980s with three mirror and astigmat. So an astigmat means you are corrected for the three main aberrations, spherical aberration, coma, and astigmatism. So those are the three main lower aberrations that you would correct in what we call a three mirror and astigmat. And astigmat means no, no astigmatism or TMF. And those, a lot of those were wanted to go unobscured, so they would go off axis and they would use off axis conics. And in 1990s, the first TMA was assembled by actually John Pigoski at the U Santa Barbara. And in the 90s, again, uh, DARPA, which is an agency for defense in the US, uh, has been funding research in, in this area, specifically what we call today full field displays that are available in CUT5, and I think now they're getting available also in ZMAX and optical software. And those were invented by Kevin Thompson at Perkin Elmer in 1984. He invented that for his PhD, actually, that I'm gonna talk just slightly about right after that. And I will come back to the full field display to tell you what they are, because they are a key tool to deal with freeform optics. And in 2011, if you look at the literature and you follow that, you realize that unobscured TMAs have matured to a point that they are used a lot in the James Webb Space Telescope. The GWST uh, instruments are using uh, TMAs. So sometimes you had a couple of different instruments back to back and you have to align these things. It's very difficult and challenging, but people have developed methods to actually do that. So the TMAs have really matured to a point 10 years ago now, I would say that it's understood how to do this, okay? All right, so what about freeform, okay? So what do we stand there? So I will start here uh, expecting that you're fairly new to this field.
just talk a little bit about the mathematical descriptions for preformed surfaces. So uh, there, there are surface descriptions we call the phi polynomials. Under that, you have Zernike polynomials we talked a little bit about, and 2D Q polynomials. Those are the two most common. And those are orthogonal over circular apertures. They have different kind of orthogonality, and that's an lecture in itself. But uh, they are different types of polynomials. The 2D Q polynomials are kind of interesting. They were uh, developed by Greg Forb, uh, that was working for a company at the time. QED was doing his spheres, and originally developed them for his spheres, and then he expanded that to the free form. And they were really targeted to help uh, designing surfaces that can be actually made. Okay, so uh, so that was kind of the original intent. But as people saw those polynomials, they were asking the question, well. If we use them in design, are they better than the Zernike, for example, because they have different kind of control, okay? So we'll talk just a bit about that next slide, but those are the two we've worked extensively with that. And what you see on the right top uh, corner here, you see a shape. And so one thing I want to say that if you have circular apertures uh, on all your optics, you know, then using those makes a lot of sense, you know, all the time. Now, it is not circular, although if you have some apertures that are not fully circular, you may still be using them and may, may not use a full aperture. And so I'm illustrating that on the next little diagram here. So for example, what you're seeing on the next diagram that I'm highlighting here with my mouse is that you see small circles in a big circle. So the big circle, let's say the aperture of the circular aperture we're talking about. And then the small circle, think of it as when you have a point in the field of view of your telescope, for example, and that, that uh, bundle of light coming from one point will create a, uh, a cast on all the optics. So when you are in the pupil of your system, you know, you feel the pupil with the field of view. You feel the entire pupil. So the points shine an entire beam and feel the entire circle of the pupil. And that's this case on the upper right. But if you go down the optical system, that field of view now will not feel the part, but will walk on the part. So you could think of all the little circle of different colors here being different field of views in your system that are feeling, shining a cast on different parts of the optics. So I'm not feeling the circular aperture and my aperture is a lot more rectangular in fact, and it is circular really. So if I, I could still use a circular aperture and then over design beyond what's useful for my field of view, but that gets a little tricky sometimes because you have to optimize that shape and you have to be a little careful, but you would weight more the field you know, right where it's effective and maybe put a couple more fields that less effective outside to control things a little bit. But you could also use maybe some other type of apertures, other polynomials that maybe would be orthogonal, maybe over a, a square or over a rectangle. Or, and so in the literature, the, the papers to look for are the paper by Vini Maharajan uh, that are published in JOSA, between 1981 and 2013, he's published a lot of papers about orthogonality of different polynomials over different shaped apertures. And so that's a good body of literature to kind of look at. And then uh, in terms of design methods, there have been people who have been really using, and, and actually including us, I have one of my students working on that, who have been uh, taking a little bit of a different approach to what we do in some other part of our program that I'll talk more about, is, is uh, we take an off-axis conic at the base of the surface, as a base, and then we add additional term, even like XY polynomials, but now on top of the off-axis conic. So we don't just use just XY. And then the way we use the XY are very much driven by aberration correction. So there's a theory behind that also. And some of that work you will find in Dr. Rose Sassian's work. He has a nice paper in 1994. He has also another paper in 2018, kind of looking at that. And then another, uh, actually Jonathan Papa, who is actually a student in my group. Uh, we've had um, a paper here in the SPIE and we also have a paper in optical engineering also that apparently, oh, it's right here, that's the second one. The paper in optical engineering is this one here. So, um, so those, uh, those two groups, I think the scope we have been working a little bit with that is very interesting. It's really interesting, I think, to do design and to look at different methods and looking at how, what is the outcome? You know, what kind of system do I get? How buildable is it? You know, how is it, is one easier to build than the other in terms of the departure of the surfaces, the slope of the surfaces and so on? 
uh, and other questions uh, uh, you may ask uh, with these things is how is it to align? Is a method more prone? How you design the system to align the system better? But is the correction as good? So those are all questions that we are answering in research as, we, as we're speaking right now, because we're taking different approaches to look at the problem. And then other kind of surface descriptions. So this two first one, you know, they're still using a global description because the, the polynomials here, you know, all the off axis conic, that's at the base here, they're all global surface description. You know, you enter those parameters and they globally describe the surface, but you could also do a local description of the surfaces. And the motivation for that is, is the following. Let's assume you fabricate a part. And as you fabricate the part, you create a bump on the part, like right in the middle or somewhere on the part. You have a bump. If you have a bump on your part, you know, trying to describe that with a bunch of P polynomials that are global, you know, it's going to take a lot of polynomials to do that. So it doesn't seem intuitively that that would be the best description for that, because it, it seems like it would be more complex than it needs to be to describe this bump. So that inspire kind of other descriptions with call local surface descriptions. So you have pond clouds with normals, the SMS method by Dr. Mignano and Benitez, uh, you know, uh, use those kind of description in their work and many, maybe other descriptions as well. Uh, we have been using radial basis function early on for free form optics with the work with Ozan Kakmaki and Eren Bauer also did some work on that. And in the end, we found out that with the radial basis function, we could do as well as with the Zernike polynomials. But again, we have to be very careful to understand how we do the design. The design methods are critical. And in fact, ourselves, we made a small mistake in the beginning on the radial basis function because at one time we were, we thought actually they may be actually better. But in fact, for normal design that you find like a telescope, a spectrometer, those kind of things that are pretty smooth surfaces, I mean, those things don't have bumps on them, you know, when you design them. They may have bumps in the fabrication shop, but not when you design them. So there, P polynomial is actually equ equivalent. You could still do the same with radial basis function, but you don't do better with radial basis function. That's why we thought at one time we may, and there was uh, a lot of subtlety in optimization where we had optimized the radial basis function for different points in the field, and what's critical when you design with local basis function, you have to make sure when you evaluate that you take a grid sample that is much denser than what your optimization grid is and make sure you evaluate that everywhere, not just where you optimize. Because if you, optim if you just evaluate where you optimize, of course, it's gonna be much better where you optimize, but not necessarily around. So in fact, the conclusion we had there is that it's the same, you know, it's the same. And then, um, but now the radial basis function can be really an interesting basis for non-imaging, non, non for example. It could be very useful, especially when surfaces are more wild and things that you may have. And so people have found some really good use of them in design in general. So there's something to keep an eye on and, and explore for your application. And then you have NURBS. So NURBS, the advantage of NURBS is that some CAD program, you know, they, they want you to enter your surface as a NURB. So if I'm designing with Zernike and then they want nerves and you have to translate Zernike to nerve and you gotta be make, you have to make sure you could really do this well, you know, because if you don't do it well, you're gonna make the wrong thing. So, so the motivation for nerves is to kind of try to avoid the step in between, between the designer and the fabricator. But the issue with designing with nerves is that they are local description. So they're gonna talk, take a lot more optimization and parameters are very hard to control. It's extremely difficult. And actually, Michael Chris, who, who worked at the Lincoln Labs, uh, MIT Lincoln Labs in the US, uh, brilliant uh, you know, engineer, has uh, developed special code to do that and worked on it for many years to, to look for ways that he wants to optimize with NERVs because he would like to be able to get uh, you know, equivalent solutions to what we do with other description, but not having to do another step in between. And, and that work is, uh, you know, is progressing. So if you are wondering a little bit about uh, the 2DQ, so here, by, uh, back here, the Zernike and the 2DQ, you may say, well, kind of what the difference, you know, between these two things? So I love this slide. This slide is kind of one of my previous slides where I kind of wrote the 2DQs at the top and the Zernike at the bottom. 
And I wrote them in such a way that you could see the equivalence and you could see the differences. So you could see the top line of each one is the rotationally symmetric component of it. And then the second line is the rotationally variant part of it. Same for the other one for the zonic wave. And if you look first at the commonality, you can see the rotation variant looks very similar. I mean, in both cases, one is using some R, you know, polynomials, this one using Q, you know, it's, 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 and we could go into the details of that, but it, they look mathematically very similar. And, but then if you look at the rotation symmetric, uh, uh, rotation invariant component, you could see first one thing, the first term is actually for the 2D queue is what we call a best fit sphere. And it's defined very specifically in the 2D queues. So that it's gonna be zero, that sphere is gonna touch the center of your apex of your surface. It's gonna be, there'll be no departure for the sphere there. And then the edge of the rotational symmetric component. So the sphere will touch, and that's how you define your sphere. Your best fit sphere is not an RMS fit. It's actually fit is touching the edge and touching the apex. And that's what they call best fit sphere in 2D queues. And that's done with this little u square, one minor u square. That's what makes that trick because you determine kind of uh, u is one at the edge and u is, is zero at the center. So you see when at the center at the edge, it goes to zero. So that's you left with, with, with that uh, sphere and there's no other departure from that. And then you have another normalization in front here of the bracket here that actually uh, gets us from normal departure, meaning along the normal to the sag. The sag is you have a plane and the sag of a surface is kind of the departure from the plane. So this coefficient in front here is kind of something to go from you know, a normal departure to a sag. And that's one of the subtlety of the 2D queues. The Zernike don't have any of that. The Zernike has still a, a sphere, a base sphere, but you see, I didn't say BS, BFS here, best fit sphere, I didn't say that. It's just a base sphere, period. And then you don't have any of those other little normalization or anything like that. So it's a little different how they interact, but they still have a lot of commonality. And actually, if you want to visualize them, on the left, you see the 2D queues, on the right, you see the Zernike. And if you look at them, you know, they look quite similar because the visualization is worth a thousand words or a thousand equations, right? And then you could see here, wow, if I'm looking at them, they look so similar, you know? But what you notice is that on the 2D queue, there's two terms missing here, you know? So here's something that is tricky when you design with free form because in the Zernike pyramid, I don't have a way Naturally, if I just put a best sphere, a sphere as a base, and then a Zernike pyramid, I could in my Zernike pyramid describe a sphere that is minus the sphere I put at the beginning. So I could have a flat surface, but in fact, with a free form on top, but in fact, my description looks like I have a sphere, and then my Zernike has a minus sphere, so I don't really see that because it's in the math, and it's not great. So those kind of things are called degeneracy meaning, you know, you don't have a unique description, basically. And you could describe the same sort of, uh, shape with many different ways. And that's an issue, you know? And because then you could create things that are not well behaved in the mathematically and in design. So the 2 cues are kind of clever in that way that they suppressed, you see, the focus term, C4, is not there. And also this piston term is not there. So the surface is always kind of at the bottom, it's touching all the time. I told you before, the best fit sphere is touching the surface at the bottom. That's why I don't have anything here. No piston, the piston is kind of just a pedestal. And then I don't have any focus term. Why? It's because I control that best fit sphere to be my focus. I do not want focus in here. And that's how I control the degeneracy. So 2 cues are better controlled for degeneracy, at least for focus. Okay, and pistol. So, however, this said, once you really understand the mathematics of those surfaces in 2D cues and Zernike, and now you could go and you could control your Zernike in design to control for those degeneracy. And then you could read this paper by Takaki here, it's an 18 that talks about those things. And, and then if you do so, our experience is that you could design, it's really equivalent, the design with either one is 100% equivalent when you actually control carefully the mathematics of that. So, 
So that's kind of what we learned. And it, you know, it took a little while and, and, and we're happy to have learned that because it was a big question we we're trying to answer. And so now we could design, we did the one is fine, but knowing the mathematics is critical to do a good job in design. Okay, now I talked to you about the full field display before, so I want to kind of tell you what is that? What are the full field displays? So imagine that or everybody can relate to a telescope, astronomy or something like that. So imagine that you're looking at the sky and the sky is a grid of stars. And the stars are, what I'm seeing on the left here is a grid of stars of points. There are points in the sky on a complete nice grid, okay? And so that's a virtual uh, world here, but we can imagine that. And then what I'm doing with my telescope, I'm taking an image of that grid of points and I'm forming an image on my detector. So imagine that the square on the right is my detector now. And each point on that detector, I'm sampling my detector, and each point uh, is gonna be uh, an image of that uh, point of light. And what I'm doing here, in fact, I'm gonna assume my telescope, all it has for aberration is coma. So one aberration, so the, 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 the image of the point will look like a little comet. And he had, if I have a rotationally symmetric system like I'm showing here, like a Cassegrain or Richard Chrétien or something like that, then I'm going to have zero comma on axis because it's rotationally symmetric and it's going to be linear with the field. Okay, comma is going to double the field, I double the amount of comma. Okay, now when I do freeform, I have each aberration uh, maybe analyzed with specific Zernike polynomials. So if I have a telescope that has multiple aberrations, I can actually go in my pupil and I can extract the amount of coma with Zernike polynomials from my wavefront, I can extract astigmatism and I can display only that aberration. That's a full field display, only that aberration. I could also plot the RMS wavefront error if I wanted to, which gives me everything at once. I can do that too, okay? But I want each aberration to be able to, um, to guide my design. And I also want you to pay attention when you freeform to the field dependence of each aberration for the freeform. So here the field dependence would be zero on axis linear with the field. Now, a major question that arose early on when we're doing optical stem design for freeform is, you, uh, and you may be familiar with the monochromatic blurring aberrations for rotational symmetric system, spherical coma astigmatism and for curvature, you say, what happened when you do the what, What's the big difference? What, what's different? So here, the basic, the best the basic theory builds on nodal aberration theory developed by Kevin Thompson in 1980. And, um, uh, basically, what we learn is that the field dependence, like you see here, is multinodal. You could actually see a zero here at the top left of this picture. And then actually, there's a band also at the bottom, but that is more a zone of correction of low and high order uh, um, uh, uh, polynomials. So there's a couple of references here. You could run. This paper is key to understand nodal aberration theory. And then this other paper has more subtlety to the point I put in parentheses here when I say when the parasol aberrations are combined with the concept of dissented aberration fields. I won't go into that today here, but that's a key concept that linked to a nodal aberration theory that you read in the second paper here. And that we don't have to go over that today to understand what we're doing. So to give you a feel for design with freeform, one of the key things we learn is that if I put a coma shape, so think of Zernike coma, you see my little pyramid here? That's Zernike coma we talked about. It's a slightly different look that what I'm seeing on the left here, but it's almost the same, it's just a tilt removed. And so I have a coma shape and I'm putting that on a free form. If I put that in the pupil, uh, I, will put, I will have a field constant coma only. But if I put that shape away from the pupil of the system, I will create field constant coma, but also other aberration. In this case, specifically for coma, I create field asymmetric, Field linear astigmatism is like a U-shaped, one in the middle here. And then I also create a defocus, which is like a tilt of the image plane, okay? And then you could read about the aberration of freeform, uh, freeform surfaces uh, in this paper by Karl Fürschbach in 2014 that we developed. But what we've done in that theory is take every single shape of this pyramid you see on the lower right, and we put them and say, okay, when I put that shape, what happened? You know, and so, and so on. So you could read about that. And then just to give you a sense of the complexity, when you read that paper, you could see that there's actually already at least six forms of astigmatism. Field constant astigmatism, that's the one we just looked at, field linear, field asymmetric, field linear astigmatism, and a few others. So you could see here what we pay attention to is a field dependence. How does it depend in the field? It's no longer 
quadratic, like we have in the rotation symmetric system, astigmatism typically is quadratic with the field. Now it's linear, or it's linear in different ways. Sometimes it's quadratic. This one is quadratic, but it's also field constant. It's definitely not the conventional astigmatism. So that's very interesting. And so then you may want to say, and I'm looking at time here, and then you want to say, well, okay, so wow, that's kind of interesting, all this theory. So, so you know, what can a preform do then? And tell me more about what it can do. So basically, you could, you could do, you could fold things in 3D and you could create unobscured solutions for preform. That's a big driver, okay? It's because your telescope in the future, you do not want obscuration. You do not want all this artifact on your image plane and the lack and the loss of light in your telescope. You want, you could enable increased performance at the same volume, same volume, much better performance, meaning more field of view, more apertures, things like that. Uh, uh, you could create a significant volume uh, reduction and weight, so 5x in volume and 10x of weight uh, at the same performance. And then you can also do a broadband system because you could do all reflective. So if you have all reflective system, you don't have all the chromatic aberration to deal with. That's a huge deal. And then you could also do flat field, like come for free, with the, and that's kind of nice. And you know, it's not always that simple, but there's sometimes trade-offs, but it's still a lot easier with freeform than it is without freeform. And it's not really more sensitive to alignment and some things like that, that the off-axis component. So there's no like a major, major draw-off, uh, uh, drawback uh, uh, of that, except I would say at this point in time, cost probably, just know-how, you know, all that stuff that will lower the cost eventually when people get processes in place to be able to do this, the same way they do aspherics today. Okay, and you could see here like a, 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 it's actually a viewfinder, another viewfinder, but now with a lot of surfaces, like five mirrors or something like that. And I put some more references for you if you could dig out, uh, if you wanted to read a little bit more about the benefit of freeform. I'll show you some success stories. Uh, the first success stories is the benefit in spectrograph and spectrometers. So what I show from left to right here, you could see if I use all spherical, you could see in the blue wavelength. So what you see here on the x-axis is wavelengths, it's a spectrometer. So I'm looking at wavelengths on the x-axis and I'm looking at the slit in the vertical axis. So both are field of view if you think about it for a few more than a few minutes. It's actually field of view because on my detector, I have, a, if you look at the little spectrometer here on the upper right, the wavelengths will be spread by my grading and will make field of view in one dimension and then perpendicular to the board, I have a slit. So I have a slit, into, a slit in one dimension and the wavelengths in the other dimension. And you can see I'm really challenging the blue here. Okay, now if I go all oh, spheres, it's not that great either. If I do a bunch of A spheres with tilt and distance, I can get a little bit better. It's more spreading the blur. The RMS doesn't get better really. And then, uh, and I, all biconic either, the, the freeform really takes you another dimension down. So in performance, so you really have a 13X improvement in the max RMS with freeform and 3X in average RMS uh, when you go to freeform. And there's a paper published in Light Science and Applications here on this spectrometer design. In the same paper, you, we talk about this spectrometer. Well, now we're taking the volume down. So we want to show that it could give compactness. So this, those are the you know, values for the spectrometer, what, you know, the specification. And then here you have an all spherical uh, design. So it's well corrected, same wavelength slit over the field of view. Now, if I take it five times smaller, you know, you can see the aberrations get crazy. Okay, that's all spherical still, but it's really bad. And so what I'm going to do now is free format can stretch out those two dimensions and I can correct. And again, I put a few publications for you here. The takeaway is 5x more compact in volume enabled by free format optics. It's really cool. Uh, another example is a telescope where we go, we look at off-axis conic versus freeform, different kind of constraints. But basically, the takeaway in the telescope that we can gain a 40 percent, he has a 40 percent decrease in volume going from the off-axis to the freeform. Okay, so that's a significant thing that you can do. And uh, the paper on that specific thing is a paper by Eric Schizer in 2019 here that you could go back and read about. So give you some ideas. And finally, the final success story I want to share is the design of an electronic viewfinder uh, for motion picture camera. This is Aaron Bauer, actually, that you're meeting here. He's also on the call. So, uh, and uh, basically here, what he did is taking like a typical viewfinder that's a lot of glass in it, typically, and it's heavy and, you know, and you have chromatic aberration and stuff like that. And he transformed it in an old freeform 
five mirror uh, 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 design. And then I like this little quote by the CTO of Ari. Ari is the company we work with on that. It's a, a company that makes high motion uh, a camera for, for motion pictures. They are very famous for their high-end cameras for movies. And it's the, the CTO said, the image quality of this freeform viewfinder is about the best I've ever seen in terms of exit pupil, resolution across the field, and contrast. To us, that, that meant a lot because he didn't have to say anything. He could have just said nothing or even say, oh, that's not that great, you know, because he had no stake in it, actually. Uh, it, the, at most, he would criticize, but he didn't. He really was impressed with the image quality. To us, that gave us a lot of confidence that the technology is really maturing to a point where it could really have impact, you know, in in many industries, and here I have all kind of parameters you could look at. So just to give you a little feel for a method to design with freeform, here's a telescope we designed. What you see here are the departures of the telescope. They have about 100 micron, 15 micron, and 240 micron peak to valid departures from, uh, from a base sphere. And you see the full field display here is uniform over the field. I'm showing the RMS wavefront area, so that's the overall performance for each point in the field. It's kind of a nice uh, diffraction limited over the full field. And I just want, and this paper, you could read about that. It's published in Nature Communications, uh, number nine. He has a reference to 2018. Uh, and there we describe an entire method for design. So if you're interested in free form, you can start reading about that. But I want to give you a feel for that. This is like really kind of neat. So if you look at this slide here, you could see an animation where as I'm putting a shape, and in this case, it's going to be Z15 on the pyramid of Zernike, if I'm putting this shape on one of the, on the surfaces on M1, M2, M3 of my telescope, you can see I'm putting the shape, and you can see all the aberration in the red kind of shape, rectangle, whatever you want to call it, uh, disappear. They all disappear. With one shape, you could get rid of all these aberrations at once. And that's just one example, but we could do that for all the different aberrations that we have. And that method in that paper explains to you how to look at that and how to do that. And so what's very important is to look at the field dependence and recognize those patterns and kind of figure out how to correct them. So I know I'm running out of time, so uh, I think I'm going to be very quick here. I just want to point that uh, we've done fabrication. Professor Matthew Davis, I want to say that the Center for Freeform Optics is actually a partnership between the University of Rochester and USC Charlotte. And Dr. Matt Davis is an expert in fabrication and he has fabricated, you know, a large mirror for telescopes, and he is he's working a lot on speeding the manufacturing process. He's worked with different materials, silicon carbide, metals, all kind of things. It's very exciting. There's a lot of new results coming out of his work. Uh, some of the key things of doing freeform is to really uh, learn and create in the space of kinematic mounting. And without going into any of the details, of course, here, again, you have something you could read about that. But the key is like, how are you going to clock your, your surface? And you're making it, you want to take it away from the machine, measure it, go back to the machine to correct. So you need to use kinematic mountings to be able, kinematic mounts to be able to exactly put it back. Otherwise, you're going to have a pretty quick mess on your surface. So this is what comes with freeform, is all that uh, things. On the other spectrum, you know, we do mass production as well. We're working on mass production for the consumer market. And we're working with like as corporation to, for example, here we're trying to do an Alvarez lens. So Alvarez is still very alive. And people like this Alvarez lens to create focus. And we're trying to look at, can we mold them? Can we make this reform very accurately? Can we mold them? And can we enter the consumer market? So we're working on that. And this is research in progress, but it's uh, coming along very nicely. And then the final slide here is, you know, metrology is kind of the elephant in the room. So in metrology, we have developed a lot of new technologies. We also calibrate and try to understand existing technology. And, uh, and then uh, our partners at UNC Charlotte, there is a lead on that has been Dr. Chris Evans at UNC Charlotte that has been really guiding, uh, kind of putting all the metrology on a roadmap. And basically, we take various metrology for freeform and we put them on all. I don't expect you to understand this chart. It's called a capability diagram. You know, it basically tells you the departure of the free form that you can measure on the vertical axis and that the, the scale of the features you may be able to, to measure, it could go all the way to the aperture of the park, for example. So it's a spatial wavelength. It's not wavelengths like when you see lambda here, it's really not the kind of lambda you may think about. It's really a spatial scale 
of what's happening on, on your free form. And so we try to compare different methodology and try to understand the gaps and try to fill the gaps to be able to serve the community better. And with that, I want to thank, of course, the Center for Free Form Optics, our partners, uh, UNC Charlotte, and um, uh, you know, all our members that uh, I introduced earlier in the talks uh, for the funding, we also had scholarships that have been helping supporting the center. And with that, I, will, I have, I think, a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much uh, for such interesting mm. uh, talk. Um, does anybody have any question? Preguntas eh, por parte del público? And if they want to ask in Spanish and they, you want to translate, that's fine yeah. too. Eh, si, si desean hacer la pregunta en español, la pueden hacer y, y la traduzco. Eh, or if you want to do question in English. Um, uh, profesor, no lo escuchamos. Profesor Guillermo Baldwin. I think the, the mic is off. Voy a decirle en español y la traduces mejor. Uh, I cannot understand in Spanish really at this point. I used to at one point, but I think I lost that capability. Okay. I will translate. Uh, <laughs> en una parte de la exposición, eh, como, como que hacía, este, como que separaba las aberraciones. Eh, o sea, hacía que aparezcan las aberraciones por separado. Mostraba el efecto de cada aberración por separado. Eso se hace, eh, se hace, este, eh, se hace con, el, con, con el método, con algún software de diseño. Eh, eh, creo que habló sobre los métodos nodales, creo. Este, ¿cómo, ¿Cuál es la filosofía de separar las aberraciones para que uno mire una aberración o otra aberración? Porque siempre uno... Cuando evalúa un sistema, sale todo junto normalmente. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, ¿Sí? So, no sé si me entiende la, la pregunta. Uh, Professor Baldwin says that in one part of the talk, you uh, spoke about how you separated the aberrations, how you could analyze each of the effects of each of our aberration. And he wants to know how you do that. Do you use any software, a design mm -hmm. software, or because you usually um, get the, the whole result um, when you measure. So how you can make the difference between them? So basically, we, uh, you, if you have a web front, the web front is really a complex shape, actually. Itself, it's a preformed kind of, you know, if you think of it that way. The wave front is complex. For each point in the field, you have a wave front. So for each point in the field, you're going to take that wave front and you're going to decompose it into Zernike polynomials. And you could do that. So for example, I go at the edge of the field and I decompose my wave front in, in a Zernike, like Z5, Z6, Z7, Z8. So this, uh, Z5, Z6 is astigmatism. Z7, Z8 is coma. So I can isolate the Zernike terms how much Z7, Z8 is together. And then, because I have two terms, Z7, Z8, I can get the orientation of the comma, because that's a of the wave front, there where the comma is. So I can get the orientation, and I can also get the magnitude of the comma by taking the square of the, uh, the coefficients. I can get the magnitude. So then I can plot that in that point in the field. And then I go to the next point, and I, I take the next wave front, and I do the same. So I can plot those aberrations as a full field displays. And that's why I'm able to isolate like the, the aberration and look at their field dependence. And actually in that uh, really big one that we had here, where I gave a little bit of a feel here, you can see uh, where we, um, uh, we uh, plot the defocus, astigmatism, coma, spherical. Hope I answered your question. You could do it for all the different terms, but you could see elliptical coma is Z10, Z11 on the Zernike pyramid. And then oblique is Z12, this 13. So we decompose basically in Zernike and plot the magnitude and orientation in the field. And then we get the, the pattern in the field and from that and from the paper by Fuchsbach in 2014 that told us what it means, you know, what, what's happening, what's connected with free form and those patterns, then I can kind of know what I'm supposed to do 
to, to correct for the aberration. So, and, and the, the method for correcting the aberration with that way is, is described in the Nature paper by Aaron Bauer uh, that I mentioned, Nature Communications paper. It has a really step-by-step -step process there. Se quedó petrificado. Muchas gracias. I think there we lost the connection. Um, yeah. Okay. So. The problem is de allá para acá, de acá para allá. O... Yeah, I believe it's Professor Bono because I can listen to you, but not her. Sí, de ella porque entre nosotros sí tenemos comunicación. Ah, ok. Uh, we, see, we see the your, your image freeze. Uh, ok, so I think, I think she's going to log in. Creo que se va a volver a conectar para poder, por, por el problema de conexión. I think she's going to re... re uh, She's going to log in again because of the connection loss. Um, yeah. Um, Eh, parte de, de la respuesta, no sé si eh, se terminó de entender lo que estaba diciendo, eh, que descomponía la, eh, el, frente, el frente de onda, eh, dado que no, eh, se expresaba de manera compleja, y, y lo descomponía utilizando los polinomios de CERNIC, y cada uno eh, de ellos te daba la orientación y magnitud. Um, y, y el paper de Bauer del 2014 le indicaba que, que, el, que, que significaba cada uno de los patrones que obtenía a partir de los polinomios y cómo conectar las aberraciones con, con los patrones que se obtenían a partir de, eh, de, 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 la, de, de, de los de, de la transformada que se les hacía al espacio de polinomios de Sarmín. Sí, no sé si se va a volver a conectar. Bueno, hay, hay, creo que hay este, varias personas que, sí. que tienen contacto con ella. De repente alguno la, le puede yeah, mandar. Uh, uh, for the participants that are now connected in the Zoom meeting, uh, does anybody have contact or can, uh, can, can contact the professor, uh, professor Holland? Um, to check if I, I can e email her if you like. Yes, yes please. Yes, you you give me just one second then. Creo que, creo que yo tengo su... ¿Yo qué?
Okay, she, she's back. Uh, thank you, um, Anna. Okay. I'm so sorry. I guess my internet kind of collapsed. I guess that was. I don't have that very often, but it looks like we had an outage here for a few minutes. So I can take more questions. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Oh, uh, this again. And, yeah. These problems are very common when we do the webinars. Um, is there any other question? Ah, hay alguna otra pregunta de parte del público? Is anybody interested in doing some free form? Or? Una, una pregunta, another question. At, pre, at, uh, at present, uh, how many of the the usual design in the in the uh, industry is made by Freeform? It's still really early. Like the people are now. So it depends what kind of industry. But definitely, like in head-worn display, people are definitely using Freeform already. You know for that for head-worn displays. Um, you know, still people are trying to make it lower cost and, and so on, more reliable or that stuff, but they're doing some free from there. And then in space optics, I think there are definitely already some company that claim to do free form and include starting to include free form like Airbus, I think has given, I've seen talks on, on free form from uh, going into Airbus systems. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, we don't always know everything, you know, because in the space industry, there's a lot of systems that are not disclosed, you know. So we don't know everything about it. But I know for sure that more and more people are uh, trying to integrate that in their systems, for sure. So it's happening as we speak, yeah. They are building systems now, but new telescopes, new things like that. So, and then, um, I mean, of course, illumination, you know, illumination, Freeform has been around for a long time for illumination. That's a completely different area. Um, uh, but you know, like it's not in like definitely not in microscopy yet that much. I mean, we did one paper on that. We did one thing, but it's not in industry yet. You know, uh, a lot of things still in research. Um, you know, so but I think it's in the next five years we're going to see a lot more integration. And uh, ten years from now, maybe it'll be much more prevalent. Yeah, prevalent. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. Uh, Rafin is um, asking if um, have you ever published a review a review of this theme um, uh -huh. related yeah. to the metrology or yeah. so we do we we as we speak we're working on the review <laughs> paper and we pretty much have it done now we just put so uh, this it, is about this we lost the connection can you please repeat yeah what you so were we are writing a review paper now as we speak and so the paper is pretty much written uh we are just assembled assembling all the references it's a pretty comprehensive paper like 15 17 pages and uh, it has design uh, fabrication metrology so it's coming out in 2020 so be posted yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be very good to, to have this together. Yeah. So we've been working on that for the last few months mm -hmm. as a group of people. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely metrology is quite complex. Um, you know, it's just, just really, I think it's complex. Metrology in general, I think it's complex anyway, because you really have to have a good control of, you know, everything you're doing and noise and source and everything to really understand everything very well. Um, uh, but for freeform, of course, it's a little bit more complicated even. And then people want not only to have metrology for freeform, but they would like to have it fast, you know? So, uh, so there's a lot of research going on in metrology, <clears throat> definitely. So um, that's probably one of the most, uh, like right now the, the one, the most expansion is going on into metrology, trying to really pull together different things. So, so we have an experiment that's going on right now where we made a, a part 
and we are doing what's called a round robin. And so that part is going to be measured at multiple companies. So with different instruments, and then each part will be measured at least twice by the same instrument at different places. So, so then we'll have all that data to kind of, kind of understand how well can we measure that one part. That this is just to compare and try to help on that map that I showed before, try to, um, try to understand better where we are at. Mm -hmm. um, big, uh, effort. Um, is there any other question? Unless there is another question, then we can um, end the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your in interesting talk and your time. Um, Muchas gracias por eh, la presentación tan interesante y, y por el tiempo. Eh, this is the last uh, talk we're going to have this semester. Este es el último coloquio que vamos a tener este semestre. And we will start the, the talks next month in August. Eh, vamos a empezar eh, los, los coloquios el siguiente mes en agosto, cuando reinicien las actividades de la universidad. Um, so thank you very much to thank you so much. the participants and to Dr. Roland. I hope we can meet in person class. in the future. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. Oh. Yeah. On my list. It's high on my list to come. Uh, Cla Claudia, excuse yeah. me. Uh, could you say where are you going to put the, the copy of the... Of the recording? The recording of the video? Sí. Um, Debería descargarlo y luego se lo uh, envía a Mauricio y deberían subirlo al repositorio de siempre de los coloquios de física. Debería estar ahí con, con los demás. O, okay, en, sí, defe uh, Ajá, uh, o en defecto lo sube en YouTube. Ok, so, um, when we start, we stop recording, uh, the video is going to be uploaded to, uploaded to the, uh, the web page of the university or, uh, it will be uploaded to YouTube in the main channel. Uh, either way, Mauricio is going to send, he's probably going to send an email um, to Professor Janik Conan and Professor Baldwin with the details or where it's going to be uh, uploaded. Thank, Thank you. you so much for the invitation and I'm looking forward to meet everyone in the future in person. Thank, Thank you. you. So we will start recording. Thank you.